The Jurameter. Let's get it done. Look, flowers in my garden. Right, I've um, got to get this done because the rain is back, so I want to get this recorded before it starts raining, so can we make this one short? Um, the Duramater. So we'll talk about the meninges generally, um, the structure of the Duramater in particular. The thing I really want to focus on are the folds, the names for the folds. We'll mention sinuses, but not too much because I've done that before. We'll mention blood supply, we'll talk about extradural and subdural hemorrhages or hematomas. And we'll talk about innovation, headache. Ooh. So this is anatomy, very, very structural focus on it. Um, they're really, really important structurally. Okay, the three meninges are connective tissue layers. So um, when we're dissecting, for example, if you're looking at the brain and it looks like a, a naked brain, it's probably actually got a very thin, translucent connective tissue layer covering it, and that's following it into the into the um, sulci and over the gyri and that sort of thing. And that layer that's really covering the brain is the pia mater. The next layer is the arachnoid mater, uh, and there's a layer. There's um you know. A, a potential space between the pier and arachnoid meters, which is the arachnoid, uh, the subarachnoid space. In there, you find most of the arteries, um, and when we pull it apart, it kind of looks a bit like a spider's web. And the arachnoid mater then is lining the inside surface, the brain surface of the dura mater, and the dura mater is the thick, tough. Dura, durable, right? The thick, tough connective tissue covering of the brain that is also lining the cranial cavity. So it's got structural functions and supportive functions and protective functions. But really, it's 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 holding the cerebrospinal fluid in place, right? So the CSF. Um, surrounds the brain so the brain can float, makes the brain a little bit lighter, protects the brain, gets nutrients to the brain, blah, 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 blah. We've done that elsewhere. Um, and if the brain didn't didn't float, it would crush all the nerves and the blood vessels and stuff rough, just from its own weight as they were going in and out of the skull. Anyway, the cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF, is in the subarachnoid space, but that arachnoid mater is up against the dura mater. The arachnoid mater is is not very tough. The dura mater is tough. Do you see what I'm getting at, how the layers work together there? Now the dura mater's got two layers, and this is an important concept. It has a periosteal layer, periosteal, next to the osteo, next to the bone. So it has a periosteal layer up against the bone, so inside of the cranial cavity. Again, I'm gonna be relying on images to show what I can show, and I can't show everything. So the periosteal layer is up against the bones of the cranial cavity, inside the cranial cavity. And the meningeal layer is um, on the brain side. The periosteal and meningeal layers are up against each other for most of, most of the dura mater. So it looks like, it just looks like one thick connected tissue sheet, but in fact it's those two layers that have kind of pushed together and fused together. That periosteal layer um, is continuous, it goes through the cranial foramina to the outside of the skull, and it's kind of continuous and kind of blends with the periosteum that's covering the bones on the outside. Do you see what I mean? Also, the periosteal layer, it's, it's really tightly stuck. It adheres to the internal surface of the cranial bones. Now, it adheres really well in the, the cranial floor. Really, really difficult to peel off that dura mater from the cranial floor when we're dissecting. Probably shouldn't talk about this with the kids next door listening, right? But when we're dissecting, right? So when you want to take the brain out, you saw around here, and this takes a little bit of practice because you've got to learn how thick the bone is as you go around. Like the bone's really thin here, it's really pretty thick here, it's really thick back here. So you want to saw through just enough that you don't go through the dura mater. So if you go through the skull bones, if you go through the bone, but not cut through the dura mater all the way around, you've done a pretty fantastic job. 
and then you can pretty much pull the calvarium, the skull cap off, and peel it away from the duramater. It might need a little bit of cutting, but you can then take the bone off and have the duramater running, you know, still covering the brain with the skull cap off. I'm talking about cadavers when we dissect, don't, not. So the duramater doesn't stick quite so tightly to the inside of the cranial bones up here, but it does pretty much all the time stick really tightly to the cranial sutures, like it blends with the cranial sutures, it's super tightly adherent there. And we'll come back to that later. I can go back outside now, we're talking normal anatomy. So in some regions, the meningeal layer, the side that's closest to the brain, the layer that's closest to the brain, it separates away from the periosteal layer. Two things can happen here, right? So when you have a separation of the periosteal layer from the meningeal layer, you can create a space, you can create a sinus. Those sinuses are lined with endothelium, like other blood vessels, and that's what forms the dural venous sinuses. So that's why that idea of those two layers is important, because when those two layers come apart, you make spaces. Also, that meningeal layer can pull away from the periosteal layer and form folds that move away from the skull and move into the brain, almost compartmentalizing the cranial cavity into compartments. This is really helpful in supporting the brain and stopping it moving around too much. So then we're creating structures, aren't we? We can give those structures names, right. Um, uh, the term falx comes from the Latin word for sickle, you know a sickle, like a curved blade. Uh, and we've got the cerebrum and the cerebellum, haven't we? So the, in the midline we see a falx cerebri, separating the left and right cerebral hemispheres, and we have a falx cerebelli, doing the same thing but separating the two sides of the cerebellum. Now you see why I came across this topic, because this is what we've been talking about in previous weeks, and I didn't realise we hadn't talked about these structures. So falx cerebri, falx cerebelli. Um, and then we have a tentorium cerebelli that, funnily enough, comes from the Latin word for tent. <laughs> the tentorium cerebelli are layers of meningeal duramater that run in towards the midline, forming a tent, um, separating the cerebellum from the cerebral hemispheres. The last bit of um, duramater, the last fold, gets called the diaphragma celli. So the cella tersica the Turkish saddle, that depression in the sphenoid bone where the pituitary gland sits is covered over by duramater. I remember looking at this in detail with a student once and there is there's quite a lot of detail to what happens to the meninges there but diaphragma celli is a sheet of duramater covering over the top of the pituitary gland allowing a hole for the pituitary stalk to pass down to. And these structures have formed some other important things. Now, um, if that's the tentorium, it separated the cranial cavity into a supratentorial space and an infratentorial space. So those terms might come up when people are talking about regions of the cranial cavity. And there's a, um, you can see there's, they've also formed a connecting tube, a connecting hole between that infratentorial and supratentorial space. That's called the tentorial notch. That's where the brain stem connects to the brain. Um, and when everything's normal, that's all fine and dandy. But can you imagine how a blow to the back of the head doesn't so much cause the, the brain to slam into the front of the the cranial bones, although that is a thing, it causes the, the anterior edge of that tentorium cerebelli, that tentorial notch, to slam into the brainstem. So a blow to the back of the head causes that duramater, because it is very tough, it's very rigid, to bang into the very soft brainstem. And of course that's a bad idea because the brainstem is full of really useful things that if they don't work then we don't work anymore. That's the structure of the duramater. Very important really important um, to neuroanatomy, to trauma and that sort of thing. There's a couple of cool other funky things we need to add to this. Arachnoid granulation. So I said that the dural venous sinuses 
are collecting blood. So you've got um, arteries going in and veins coming out, which is supplying blood to the brain, draining blood from the brain. There's more to it than that, but not today. So those, we have br veins running from the brain to the dural venous sinuses, and that's how the blood leaves the cranial cavity through the dural venous sinuses. We've talked about that elsewhere, go and watch that one. Um, and those get called bridging veins. Now, arachnoid granulations are the arachnoid mater pushes up, like blebs up, protrudes up into the dura mater. Oh no, I've got a bird gone in me bush. Is that, it's not making a nest in there, is there? The only reason that's a bad thing is it's, it's a bit traumatic having the blackbird nest there because the chicks don't. Anyway, go see the vlogs. Um, where was I? Yes, so these are the arachnoid granulations. So the arachnoid mater pushes up into the dura mater, and I said that the cerebrospinal fluid is in the subarachnoid space. So through those arachnoid granulations, that's how cerebrospinal fluid can pass back into the venous system. Blood supply. Okay. Meningeal arteries. That's easy, isn't it? So the middle meningeal artery is the biggest one. We've talked about this a number of times before. The uh, maxillary artery is a branch of the external carotid artery that runs into the deep face. And the middle meningeal artery is a branch that runs up through foramen spinosum. And then it runs between the bone and the dura mater. So between the bone and the periosteal layer of dura mater. And it branches out, it's very pretty, and supplies blood to the dura mater and to the bone. And of course bone is more active, so it's probably going to be supplying more blood to the bone than it is to the dura mater, which is a connective tissue that doesn't really use a lot of energy. Um, so the middle meningeal artery, and that's an artery that we talk about because it can be damaged if the bone is fractured at the side of the skull or a blow to the side of the skull damages the middle meningeal artery. We'll come back to that. So that's the blood supply to the dura mater. Um, generally speaking. Uh, the middle meningeal vein is the counterpart to the middle meningeal artery and that drains blood from the dura mater. And that passes back again to the deep face and drains blood to the pterygoid venous plexus. So we have blood draining from that space between the dura mater and the cranial bones into the deep face. And you can follow those veins down in another video that we did. Nervous innervation. What's the main cranial nerve that's carrying sensory innervation from the face and the head? Cranial nerve 5, the trigeminal nerve, is also the major sensory nerve from the dura mater. Oh, it's getting really darker there. I better hurry up. Um, so the three branches, V1, V2, V3, ophthalmic, um, maxillary and mandibular branches of the trigeminal nerve also carry sensory innervation back from the different parts of the dura mater. Which is somewhat interesting anatomically, but way more interesting when you consider headache. So noxious stimulus to the dura mater can cause pain and can be a source of headache. Now, if you think about the regions of the face and the head, that the cranial nerve, the cranial nerve 5, the trigeminal nerve, carries sensory innervation from the skin and the mucosa, and you think about referred pain that we've talked about before, then pain from the dura mater can get referred to different parts of the head and face because those sensory fibers are passing with the trigeminal nerve. Do you see what I mean? So consider if somebody's got a headache your knowledge of the trigeminal nerve and the fact that it innervates the dura mater. There are lots of causes of headache, it's not entirely understood, but that is a cause of headache. See what I mean? It's getting very dark now. Um, okay, that's it. That's the anatomy of the dura mater. The layers, where it is, its folds, blood supply and innervation. So clinically, what's really important? Well, what's Really important is that anatomy, but on top of that, you've also got extradural hematoma and subdural hematoma, and generally they're quite different and they're really important. So, extradural hematoma then, so we're talking about 
Um, damage to a blood vessel, extra dural, outside the dura, so between the cranial bones and the dura mater. Um, most commonly, this is caused by trauma, so it's acute, and it's most commonly damage to an artery and the middle meningeal artery or a branch of, which means that the bleeding into that space is at arterial pressure, so it's going to be rapid onset and cause headache and probably loss of consciousness. And what it's going to do is it's going to tear that periosteal dura mater away from the internal surface of the cranial bones. Um, and as we saw, it's not that well stuck up, stuck down up here, but the dura mater is unlikely to be pulled away from the, uh, the, the sutures between the cranial bones, which means that when you look at uh, transverse head CT, you'll see um, hyperdensity um, in, a, in a convex a lens shape next to the bone and right next to the bone. And that's where the blood has pooled and pushed the dura mater away from the bone, but then it's limited it can't keep pushing the dura mater away because it's tied down too tightly at the sutures. Generally speaking, that's not always the case. Sometimes it can be a venous bleed because, we, as we saw, there are veins there. Um, and sometimes it can get pulled away from those sutures. But that's the most common presentation. And you've got to fix it quickly because the patient, the usual description is the patient might uh, regain consciousness and have a lucid interval, but then can lose consciousness again after that and what's happening is of course you're compressing the cerebral hemispheres and we're in a closed box up here so where is all that soft tissue going to go Well, it's going to get pushed down through that that gap through that tentorial notch then it's going to start compressing the brain stem and you know it's not good Okay, that's an extradural hematoma. What about a subdural hematoma? So a subdural hematoma typically refers to those bridging veins being torn. Now, consider this. The brain is floating in cerebrospinal fluid, so it can move a little bit. The dura mater is stuck to the cranial bones, so it cannot move at all. And yet there are bridging veins passing from the brain to the dural venous sinuses, which means that those bridging veins could tear Sometimes this is caused by trauma, sometimes by a fall, you know, this might happen in an elderly person, they might have a fall and seem to be okay. But the difference here is, of course, that if these bridging veins tear, then that blood is going to leak more slowly. This is going to have a slower onset. This is going to be maybe chronic, but certainly subacute, right? Because we're not dealing with arterial pressures, we're dealing with, with venous pressures. Um, and... This, bleed, this blood will collect on the, the, the deep surface of the meningeal layer of the dura mater, um, which means that you're going to see, if you look at a transverse head CT, uh, you're going to see uh, a hyperdense region that is uh, crescent shaped. It's not going to be limited like... It's not, going to, it's not going to be limited by the sutures here because it's, it's on the other side of the dura mater. Do you see what I mean? So the blood will just keep leaking around in the space that's available to it, causing, you know, like a crescent moon-shaped um, indication. That might be associated with trauma. It might not. It might be associated with brain atrophy. So as the brain gets smaller, then the bridging veins have to stretch a bit further. You know, you've, got to, you've really got to think about your anatomy in situations like this to work out what's going on. Another type of bleed would be subarachnoid hemorrhage, but as we're talking about the dura mater, I'm not going to talk about it. You can go and look that up yourself. I've probably talked about it somewhere else, haven't I? Right, that's it. Ooh. It's going to rain any minute now, so we're done. I'll see you guys next week. Oh, by the way, the dura mater, yeah, it does continue down with the spinal cord as well, but I think it only continues as one layer, not as those two layers but there's a dura mater covering to the spinal cord and the roots of the spinal nerves.